Hi everybody, I am creating a new vlog on a review for a book I just read called Adams vs. Jefferson, The Tumultuous Election of 1800 by John Furling. And I thought this was a pretty interesting topic. It intrigued me because I'm interested in elections and I'm also interested in the early founding fathers and the early history of early Federalist period in the United States. So I thought this was a really intriguing topic, so I was interested to read a little bit more about it. And some of the things that I found particularly intriguing is that this election is one that is in a sense a little bit more modern than the three prior elections for George Washington's first ter two terms and also for John Adams' single term as president, his first term. And I thought that uh, this book really kind of shows us a little bit more the evolution of how the country evolves in terms of becoming a more slightly more modern democracy, and also in terms of how it evolves from a more revolutionary stance, which kind of dominates the era from the revolutionary period and the creation of the constitutional era, until this fourth presidential election that took place in 1800. The election takes place largely between the candidates of John Adams, who is running for his second term as president, and Thomas Jefferson, who is the then sitting vice president, who is from the Republican Party. John Adams largely was from the Federalist Party, though perhaps was a little more loosely associated with them than historically he's been credited with. And then as a third choice, you have a candidate who was advocated by Alexander Hamilton, who was the leader of the Federalist Party, but who did not like John Adams, so he instead secretly advocated for Charles Pinckney to be the president instead. Then you also have a fourth figure who played into this, which was Aaron Burr, who was a Republican who was from New York, and he was supposed to be the Republican vice presidential candidate, but that didn't quite work out exactly in, that, in the light that uh, the original plans were supposed to be. So this... Uh, I'll explain that in just a moment, what I mean by that. But this election was really very intriguing on a number of different levels. I found it intriguing that you had a candidate like Alexander, or like John Adams, who represented the Federalist Party, but yet who was largely not very well liked by many of the leadership figures within the party, including Alexander Hamilton, who was the primary leader of the Federalist Party, and had been during the foundings of the party in the Washington's two terms of office, and certainly he held that role to some degree as well during the uh, term of John Adams. For some reason, the two of them did not get along very well, and in part I think it was due to the fact that Hamilton felt slighted by Adams. Hamilton, I think, had a fairly sizable ego, and he didn't really feel that Adams did enough to support him and his intentions and hopes of being a primary leader and a mover and shaker within the Adams administration. And Adams didn't really want to do that. And so uh, Hamilton was quite resentful of that, and I think as a result, that's why he... Uh, publicly, at least to some degree, supported Adams, who he did support in, in the 1796 election, but in 1800 he very definitely came out against Adams, and so much so to one point that he actually wrote a scathing 
uh, booklet about his views on Adams and why Adams was not suited particularly for the leadership role in the Federalist Party or in for being a president. And yet, oddly enough, he writes this scathing uh, several dozen page pamphlet and then in the very end says, yeah, but all that aside, I still urge your support for Adams. And that just seems kind of bizarre, but for Hamilton, perhaps, it's not as bizarre as um, he was known sometimes for doing some very strange things with, with his writings. So uh, he really helped to split the Federalist Party in many ways because he secretly wanted to support the candidacy of Charles Pinckney, who was from South Carolina, who was a Federalist, and so he secretly urged support for that. And when Hamilton, you know, he knew was very well connected with a lot of people, and he could urge uh, the electors from the electoral system to support um, Pinckney, perhaps to some degree. And certainly that would hurt Adams very clearly. Really, though, as this was an early election, and I don't think that the they, these leaders were as students of democracy as much as people are perhaps today. And so the result was that this urging of support for Pinckney really just ended up splitting the Federalist Party, which created uh, more support for um, Jefferson and Burr. In those days, electors each had two votes, and they voted for two candidates, and those two candidates, whoever they would be, would become the the first one uh, that got the most votes would be the president, and the second candidate who got the second highest number of votes would be the vice president. And so you could end up with two candidates from different parties becoming a president and vice president, as in the case of Adams and Jefferson in 1796, who represented completely different parties, had very different points of view and political perspectives and philosophies, even though they were great friends personally during the Revolutionary Era, they were not very good friends by the time that they had become the president and vice president, and in fact were barely on speaking terms. So they uh, had very strong disagreements. And so here you have two candidates who are leading the country, suppose, well, not candidates, at that point they were president and vice president, who were the key leaders within the country, and yet they were at odds with one another. And in fact, Jefferson was rather a um, political operative himself, and so he engaged in a lot of illicit activities against Adams and against Adams' policies and presidency that really ended up damaging Adams considerably uh, over time. Adams, of course, did plenty to damage his own presidency as well, and so uh, he had helped himself in more ways than one in that regard. Um, so this was really a strange system in the, in the way that it was set up. So when the election takes place in 1800, Jefferson and Aaron Burr end up getting exactly the same number of electoral votes. And the way that the Constitution read was that if that happened, then the election was cast into the House of Representatives, and the representatives would have to decide who would become the president and the vice president. Well, it really wasn't very... Uh, it seemed, perhaps, on the surface that Jefferson was supposed to be the candidate, and Burr initially said that that was what he wanted. But when it came, push came to shove, I would imagine it was very hard to just say, well, I don't really want to be president of the United States. And so Burr secretly campaigned to some extent or lobbied to try to get electors to support him for the presidency. Many Federalists, and, well, and the odd thing is, is that the Congress was actually controlled by the Federalists at that time, the opposition party. And so they were having to choose between two Republican candidates, somewhat 
as if choosing between the lesser of two evils. And so they ended up uh, having several dozen votes in the House to determine who would become the next president of the United States. And it seemingly was quite deadlocked until finally a an elector um, changed his vote. I believe it was from Delaware, which was a small state. He was the only elector from that state. And he changed his vote and uh, from Burr to Jefferson, largely when perhaps Jefferson may have agreed to some conditions uh, to support some of the Federalist policies that had been put into place in the presidencies during um, uh, George Washington's time. And so that may have happened, albeit there's not really clear evidence that shows that Jefferson did agree to something like that, but there is unstated evidence in the sense that Jefferson never went against those agreements that the elector asked for specifically, even though he had been vehemently opposed to some of these situations like the creation of the Bank of the United States at that time. And so uh, he was against that, but yet he never tried to dismantle it after he came into the presidency. So perhaps he did agree to these uh, conditions. At any rate, that brought an end to this election battle. Uh, it really destroyed Aaron Burr's career, as a, even though he became the vice president. As soon as 1804's election rolled around, Jefferson dropped Burr immediately because he had been disloyal to the Republican ideals and had been disloyal to Jefferson, obviously, and in fact, throughout the Jefferson's presidency, he had virtually nothing to do with Burr and largely ignored him throughout um, that entire four-year term. So this election is major, and a major election because it's the first time in U.S. history that you have a change between two parties, between the Democrat, or I'm sorry, between the Republicans and the Federalists. The Federalists who had been in power since Washington's time for three presidencies, three terms, and now suddenly they have switched over to being a Republican-led presidency. And so this is a major switch in U.S. history, and, and one that people at the time were very concerned about because they thought that perhaps the switchover could result in bloodshed and uh, perhaps even Jefferson himself somewhat referred to this election as a revolution, but it was a bloodless uh, change in power. And so really I think that makes it a unique situation in that time in the context of 1800 in the world. So it was really a very interesting time period. I think the book itself, Furling's book, was pretty interesting. It was well written. And it was one that was pretty concise, not a very long book, so it was an easy book to read in that regard, and certainly gave a lot of good details and information about the characters of the major players of the time, and it gave a good sense of some of the thinking, the political thinking of the time, and where people's heads were in terms of how they viewed the electoral process and democracy of those days. So, I certainly, if you're interested in this book, I would urge you to pick it up. It is a good read, and it is certainly instructive, and hope that you find this book vlog to be uh, interesting and, and uh, insightful for you in your pursuit of history. So, um, thanks for your time, and I'll see you the next time that I do one of these.